John, thanks for sitting down. We've had the podcast for like a year, but this is the first chance I've had to sit down with you, our awesome. most most requested guest. So before we start, let's let's talk real quickly, because I'd like to, I think most people are going to be obviously interested in hearing what you have to say about coaching and MMA. What I was thinking about this last night, and I think that's that's probably our best use of time. But before we do, a real common question that I get a lot, I, I know comes up a lot, is about motivation. Motivation for training, what keeps people training, motivation for jujitsu. What would you say about that? <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's something I've, I've uh, been asked to do a few times lately. Like companies get in touch and they bring me into their staff. And it's al- almost always the same thing. They say, just stand up there and motivate them for 20 minutes. And um, I did genuinely give it a lot of thought. And the best opener that I had for all those talks that I start off by saying, uh, I believe motivation to be bullshit. The idea of motivational speaking to be complete nonsense. And the reason why I say that is I've never seen somebody successfully motivated to do something they didn't already want to do for long enough to get good at it. So you might give someone a Rocky type speech and motivate them to do a training session, but you won't motivate them to train daily for five years or 10 years, the typical length of time it takes to get to a level of what we would generally describe as expertise. Um, Again, one of my sort of stories I'll use to illustrate that is um, let's say, let's say Connor, obviously he's a big name, people will know him. I'm close with him and, and I've, I, I, you know, trained him for a long time and we do a lot together. I would have had zero success in motivating him to learn the piano. I could give him a really cool speech. I could try to convince him of the utility of it. I might get him to do a lesson, but I wouldn't get him to train, you know, four or five hours a day at the piano for 10 years and all of a sudden he's a great piano player. So I never motivated Connor to train MMA or Jiu Jitsu. He trained, what I was good at doing, I think, was ex- was explaining the utility of it, showing him why it would be useful to train a certain thing, whether it's grappling or striking or, or, or whatever. Convince him, I think if you can convince somebody of the utility of it, um, then they'll want to train it themselves. In, in terms of a competitive athlete in areas that they don't necessarily want to do, the areas that they do want to do, that they already enjoy, they're going to do it themselves right. anyway. So, uh, and yeah. that's assuming they're motivated by the goal to begin with. Yeah, so, yeah, of course, yeah, okay, so there, there, there's the question. So when someone comes in, you ask them, what, what do you want? To, I want to get good. Yeah. You know, that's a very general term. I want to get good. And, uh, if it's in MMA, I want to get good at MMA. I want to be a good fighter. Well, you're not going to start it unless there's an element of MMA you already enjoy. And that's the part that won't require any motivation. Maybe you really, again, I kind of make the joke, right from the start, Connor really loved punching people in the face. Mm -hmm. Never had to trick him into doing it, never had to motivate him into doing it. He was something he seemed to enjoy doing all of his own. (laughs) And was very uh, talented at it, Uh, uh, very good at it. And um, maybe on other areas of it, at the beginning, weren't as fun to him. You know, anybody that comes into an MMA gym, if they're extremely good at grappling, at the beginning, learning the striking element can be, it, it kind of sucks. You know, you're, you're doing something, you're already very good at one area, and now you're learning a new area, and you have to go back to being a beginner again, and you're getting crushed by people, and vice versa. If someone comes in and they're a very skillful striker already, learning grappling from the start kind of sucks. So um, I guess you could say you've got to motivate them to train in the areas that they're weak in, but I don't think it works. I don't think, you know, cool YouTube speeches or, or whatever will work for a long enough period of time to make them good. Yes, you can watch a cool YouTube video and it gets you pumped and you go down, you'll do a good workout, but you won't do it daily for 10 years. Yeah. What I think a coach's role is and what you'll have success if you can do it, I'm repeat myself, is to explain the utility of it and demonstrate the utility of it. And the, if their ultimate goal is to get good at MMA and you show them at, that this, this is an area that if you get good at it, it will help you with your ultimate goal, and you convince them of that, and they're smart enough to see that, then your, your job is done. You can kind of set back and, and just let, leave them at it. That begs the second question, um, which is what are you going to say to someone, maybe a younger student or someone that says, man, I just don't have the motivation to go to, to class anymore, John. What do you do when you don't want to go to jiu-jitsu class? Um, so, you know, a few different ways in that. I, 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 I do think one very good technique for that if you're, if you, if, you, if you initially did enjoy jiu-jitsu, like, you know, and you, you train for a couple of years, but you hit that slump, which everybody hits, um, is force yourself not to do it for a month. 
and like you know after a few days you might get itchy or you might want to watch a video but deny yourself it for a calendar month do not watch a single jiu-jitsu video do not take an underhook on a girlfriend do not you know think about the gym do not walk near the gym get you know force yourself not to do it and that to me uh, by the end of that month mm -hmm. you either are cannot wait to get back into it or you know maybe it's time to move on maybe, sure. maybe it's time to try something different so people have asked me before i get a lot of questions about you and people ask me about coaching and, and coaches and who are, who's good at what and one thing i've always tried to explain to people is at, as you know is that being able to be good at jujitsu yourself and being able to teach a class are wholly separate skills and you have to respect both and learn both if you want to be able to teach a good class and we've all seen like great jujitsu guys that can't teach a class at all. And I also feel the same way about cornering athletes, um, running fight practices. Um, all those things are separate skills, as is, I believe, being able to look at somebody and see what belt they should be in jujitsu, or be able to look at a fighter or a jujitsu athlete and see the strengths and weaknesses of where they're at. And one thing I know, because we've known each other for you know 20 years now, uh, you are particularly good at assessing people's strengths and weaknesses very quickly when you look at them, um, as well as obviously the coaching and teaching part of it. But I, I haven't seen too many people that have that skill the way, you, and you've always had that, that I, as long as I can remember, which begs the question, when you're looking at a fighter for strengths and weaknesses, what, are, what is it you're primarily, primarily looking at? And on the, the secondary question to that is, when you have a fighter and you're looking at their opponents. Right. Um, yeah, okay, general, uh, pr pretty general. From a very practical point of view, if you, if you have a new fighter, you could, like this, this morning, my session today was um, positional. So what that is, we stress test commonly occurring positions against various different bodies and see where the weaknesses are and then try to plug them. So you, maybe there's certain, maybe you're very difficult to take down, so you don't, uh, I, you, your coach doesn't get to see you often on your back playing guard. You don't want the first time to experience that to be in a, in a competitive environment. So I think the coach's role is to make sure that all of those commonly occurring positions, there's only so many of them. I think that's what I was, what I was, what I was pretty okay at at the beginning was I came from engineering, so I understood how to run a test. I understood how to go from a hypothesis to something we could call um, not a fact, but but um, something we can almost say to be true. So I was pretty good at being uh, recognizing that every individual fight that I watched was was basically a test, and we could see that certain things happened more than others. Yes, you want to have jump, spin, and hook kicks and stuff like that, but they may happen sometimes. But almost every fight, there's going to be an under over position. So I spend most of my time on positions that happen most of the time. So I just want to make sure that if I have an MMA fighter, someone, if someone comes into me and they only have two weeks training and they're saying to me, can you help me improve? That's the first thing I'm going to do is put them, I'm going to stress test them into commonly incurred positions and see where the weaknesses are and then spend most of my time on those positions. Um, so yeah, it's, it, I, I think it's almost, boringly obvious but that's 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 what I that applies for sure to the curriculum you're running them through but when you when you just look let's say you're out here uh, for practice this morning and you're just looking at a room full of athletes and you were to notice one or two that particularly stood out relatively quickly yeah what would be the things that you'd notice first it's probably how they're talking that's that's going to be the most interesting thing is um, uh, why questions you know if you, if you show a technique well I've seen it done this way, or when I do it, they tend to move this way. Um, the person that has that approach, you can probably begin to see that that person is very thoughtful in what they're doing, and a thoughtful, mindful fighter is somebody who's going to improve quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wary of the person that, do this five times, do this five times. Put your hand here, put your hand here. I like to hear, I like to hear whys. Um, long as it doesn't become too obsessive with like what if he does this what if he does this but you know okay oh that's interesting you, you don't put you you go here rather than here huh why and um i've noticed that people that tend to get good fast are ones who are thoughtful about their practice they don't just mindlessly go through the motions um you know i, I, I can use examples of, of different fighters i have that 
pretty much at the end of every training session. That evening, I'll get a list of questions mm -hmm. because they they went home and they're they're running over to practice in their head and saying, "Ah, oh, do you remember at that moment you put your hand here, but last week you showed with it there. Was has something changed, or is that an improvement, or is there something I should be aware of in that?" Yeah, so just just the guy who's thoughtful. That to me will be more important than spotting some guy who's like super athletic or right. or or or, or, nice or yeah. We you know we have to assume that the guy's going to be mentally strong. Right. He's going to be physically strong. There's going to be a certain level of athleticism. If he's a performance athlete, if he's a competitive jiu-jitsu player or a competitive MMA fighter, so let's not even talk about those things. They're they're things that just should be. So yeah, that that's that's what and, I. And to the degree years. you feel comfortable saying it. In relation to not letting too much out about training in the team and whatnot, what about an opponent? So you see Connor's next opponent, right? Um, you know, I'll, I'll have to credit uh, I'll have to credit Forrest Griffin on this. So I was talking to him a long time ago about this, and we were saying about you know I, I was cautious of spending too much time thinking about an opponent because I don't know if they're going to come out with a different stance than they've been than we've seen before. Maybe they did spend the last part three months you know maybe because a guy might only be fighting once every six months so if you didn't see him in that six month period maybe he's now a southpaw and he was always orthodox right. maybe he's gotten really good at kicking maybe he just focuses on leg kicks now maybe he just focuses on takedowns i don't know if, uh, if that's changed so don't spend too much time worrying about your opponent but one thing forrest said was uh techniques might change but tendencies don't tendencies? so tendencies yeah. this guy will tend to always slip punches rather than catch them. Uh, he will tend to lean back rather than level change. Um, let's use a, let's use a, a, a recent contest, uh, Mas Vidal versus Darren Till. So I would imagine when I watched that contest, early on it seemed to me that Mas Vidal had spotted the tendency for the taller, rangier fighter to lean back out of a shot. A very, very common uh, tendency for tall, rangy fighters. If they get away with that in the gym of being able to lean back, it's it's a it's a nice way of avoiding striking rather than like shelling up or rather than uh, blocking or rather than slipping. It's a way of defending against strikes. So if we can spot that tendency in their contests, that'd be something that we would look to exploit. So okay, this guy is going to drop his hands and lean back. Let's get it, get it, get on the inside with our feet and and throw a shot there. If instead he didn't do that, if instead we spotted that he's a slipper, so some guys, especially coming from an amateur boxing background, they tend to fight a little bit more side on and they tend to slip a lot of punches. Mm -hmm. That's a tendency. Mm -hmm. So if we can exploit that tendency by, by attacking that angle, um, that's something that we will look to exploit. And then just to put an asterisk beside that, I will say two things. One, your opponent could change with three days to go. Yeah. It's happened those a bunch of times. Yeah. You know, let's let's talk about a fight. Most people know the the uh, Aldo changing to Mendes. You probably couldn't get a bigger change of of a stylistic opponent, a you know a, a more or less a Muay Thai specialist going to a wrestling specialist. Um, I think if you were super focused on your who your opponent is and training for them, that change would have put a lot of people off, and they would have said, "Hey, I just you know I've been the last three months." working leg kick defense and and so on uh, and now i'm going to be dealing with someone shooting from the start but we don't do that we we certainly looked at tendencies that aldo had and when that fight eventually came we, we were able to expose them um but the majority of 13 was, seconds i think it was 11, <laughs> 11 seconds <laughs> connor will correct you on that yeah. 11, 11 seconds. you watch it and hit the clock it's 11. um but you know Thankfully, I came from a good stock and that I focused most of our training on the fundamentals of MMA, that we had good clean striking and good clean grappling. And then we could mold it a little bit depending on who we were facing, but not get obsessed with who we're going to be facing because they could change. And, and their, techniques, their, their techniques might have changed somewhat. But as Forrest said, it's, it's difficult to get away from tendencies. Yes. And John Jones spoke about this when he was facing, um, when he was facing DC. And, and, and sure enough, even DC said himself, ah, that's gone, that tendency is gone. It was, it, 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 he was kind of slipping shots. And it wasn't, it was still there. And, and, and it was exposed in the fight and, and, and it caused the, the end of the contest. So tendencies are hard to shake off. Carl called that back in the day, faceless opponents. Okay. I think you remember talking about that with his athletes, like uh, 
always never allowing them to visualize an expression, which is very, or a face to the guy, you know, okay. it's very. I say something similar that on the night, there's going to be someone on the other side. I can't say if it's going to be the guy that we signed for six weeks ago, but there'll be someone there. He'll be roughly the same size as you and he'll know striking and grappling. That's about as much as we can say for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, keeping on that same topic, you accomplished something that I, I don't think a lot of people have, well, not everyone has given you a, as much credit as I think you deserve when you went from coaching MMA to all of a sudden coaching one of the biggest boxing matches in the world, right? <laughs> and, and I don't think you've coached, I think you've cornered a few striking matches, obviously, but not a boxing match at that level. So. I actually hadn't. Yeah. It was my first time ever being involved in a striking match. Just boxing. Only. Oh, you've well, not done kickboxing? I've never done a okay, kickboxing wow. fight, it's even an amateur boxing fight. Oh, okay. <laughs> so what did you do for that fight? Um... I mean, obviously you brought in other people to help, but you were still the main coach for that whole fight. You yeah. were the main trainer for that fight. Yeah, so what, you know, what, um, what did you do mentally for that? I just tried to make the most of the limited time. I think we signed for that fight. Well, they, were, they were flirting with each other online for almost a year, but it, 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 we didn't actually start training for or get serious about it until 10 weeks out. So it's I, just I, short. Yeah, yeah you yeah, know, it's very uh, short. to face someone who is... 30 years of super high level, right. you know, pure boxing training to, to 10 weeks out be told, okay, get me a boxing ring because we're going to, we're doing a boxing contest. Yeah. You know, it was literally over a weekend, we formed a, a boxing gym. I'd never had a boxing gym and I put together a boxing gym. And then for those 10 weeks, um, we tried to find areas that maybe would, would be, um, we, we could play with weaknesses, uh, try, try to go fight a little bit in the clinch and, and, and use some techniques, arm drags and stuff like that. Some of it paid off, some of it didn't. It was cool to see. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we got to the back a few times and, and uh, the referee was stopping it pretty quickly. We thought we might be able to get off more shots there or at least try to catch him as he turned back to faces. Put it this way, we knew we weren't going to like 10 weeks out say, okay, let's just go classical boxing training for 10 weeks and try to outbox the guy. Right. The guy's doing it his whole life. It would, right. be, it would be as silly as if it was the other way around and Floyd going, okay, it's an MMA fight, I'm gonna take him down, I'm gonna pass his guard, and I'm gonna choke him. Right. And that's what I'm gonna do 10 weeks of. Of course he wouldn't, he would just keep doing what he's doing and, and try to learn a little bit of takedown defense. Right. So we were going with our striking training, we always did, and see if there were some areas that we could, we could expose. But I didn't see the point in just trying to box for 10 weeks and people saying, bring in, insert famous boxing coach's name right. for that 10 weeks. For what? What's, right. what's he going to do in 10 weeks? Right. Show us a jab, show us a, a certain combination. Right. Um, we didn't have the time for that. So we tried to make as, uh, as much out as we could and enjoy it as well. You know, there was a certain amount of theatrics involved and it was, it was a, a, an unusual experience for me yeah. to be, uh, to be w at one of the most uh, anticipated and watched uh, boxing contests uh, ever, yeah. <laughs> you know. So to have, have had to have had any involvement in it at all was uh, it's one of those stories that you know in, in 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 a decade's time or two decades time we'll still have a giggle about it. And as I walked into the gym, it was funny the uh, where we are now. There was a photo of the fight, and it still caught my eye. And I was like, oh yeah, we did that. We had a boxing contest with <laughs> Lloyd Mayweather. <laughs> it's, a little boxing you know, it's just a bizarre yeah. statement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a really bizarre statement, but that's somewhat over the years with, 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 when dealing with Connor, you kind of just get used to bizarre stuff happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you think about, what do you look for as far as coaches? Now, um, in specifically because you're so busy and, and have been so busy for like the last 10 years at least, you're cornering fights, I, I think, almost every weekend, right? Almost. Yeah. So you've also brought up younger coaches and people that have come up with you, people like Owen and other people. What are you looking for in one of those coaches? So almost always the same thing is that they're able to create a, a safe uh, environment in the gym and one where failing is um, one where failing is celebrated. So I think that's probably the most important thing to focus on. Um, Different coaches are going to have different uh, technical specialities, whether they're a grap wrestling coach or striking coach, MMA coach. But I, I think if you, you know, in, in, 
for most performance MMA fighters, okay, they're coming to the end, they're probably already pretty decent at grappling or striking before they're, you know, getting ready for an MMA fight. They're not just raw. Um, for those guys, you almost, you're better just getting out of their way. They're going to develop themselves anyway. Yes, you've got to have your, your fundamentals, you've got to have your techniques, but let's assume we already have that because no matter what MMA gym you go to, everybody is, knows how to coach good striking, good grappling. So I think what I try to focus on is an environment where the, uh, a group of 20-somethings don't mind looking silly. A group of 20-somethings don't mind slipping and falling. Yeah. A group of 20-somethings don't mind trying something new and failing on it and getting caught with a submission or getting caught with a shot. And they, you know, because there is striking involved, they're not terrified to try something that they know could get them kneed in the head or, or badly hurt. So that the, everybody in the gym is aware that, look, if you get to a certain position where you can do damage, we're not going to do that in the training environment. And if you, if you can do that and if you can create that and if you can foster that, I think the rest almost looks after itself. It's a question I like that I, I read actually from Peter Thiel, but tell me something you believe to be true that most people would disagree with you about. And bonus, if they would also not just disagree, but maybe even be offended. Um, I, I, we did touch on it earlier on, so I would have said um, that uh, the idea of motivation is, is bullshit. It's just because I've never seen, just to repeat myself, I've never seen somebody motivated to do something they didn't already want to do for long enough to get good at it. Maybe the other one I'll say is that uh, talent doesn't exist, and that gets me into plenty of online. You're going to have a big, long conversation with Adam if you... Plenty of online arguments. There are certainly um, examples of, um, say for example, hardware advantages that some people are born with. For example, say basketball. If you, don't ha if you weren't born with the hardware of being plus six foot four, it's unlikely you can get anywhere really at a high level in basketball. Now, there's probably someone that has thought already of an exception to some guy who's five foot 10 and he was able to play but it's almost impossible to get around the hardware aspects of some sports. What I have always loved about combat sports is that we have weight classes. Yeah. So you, no matter your weight, there's a weight class for you. Mm -hmm. So hardware plays a much smaller role in combat sports. To, to use another extreme example, uh, you could never be a jockey. You know, there's just no way. You just don't have the hardware to be a jockey. Kill the horse. Uh, you would kill the horse. Um, and you know, I don't have the hardware to be a basketball player. But we could both compete in combat sports because we have weight classes. Mm -hmm. So if the hardware plays less importance, then it's going to come down to the software. And I think that when someone has a better software, uh, my 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 computer uh, vocabulary is going to let me down here. When someone has a better operating system than somebody else. It's very tempting to say they're talented, mm -hmm. but in my experience, and to use your phrase, only every time, the people with the best operating systems earned it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, I've just seen, I know it's anecdotal, but I can, I, I can literally think of 20, solid 20 examples or so of, of guys starting at around about the same time with similar hardware, similar genetics, similar athleticism, and we fast forward five years, and this guy is twice as good as that guy. Why, how the hell is he twice as good as that guy? Mm -hmm. If it was the same coach, mm -hmm. same environment, what was different? Oh, he's talented. Mm -hmm. I think that's equivalent to saying, oh, he's a magician. Mm -hmm. he, learns, he learned magic. Mm -hmm. That's not a, comfort, a comforting answer for me. Mm -hmm. I may as well lock up my gym and walk away if the coach didn't play any part in it. It's like uh, giving up. Yeah, he may as well quit. And just, ah, he's, ta he's talented. But in my experience, the guys that got twice as good as the other guy who improved his operating system was because every training session was done with a type of focus and intent that was absent in the other guy. Mm -hmm. Earlier on in my session, uh, we, we did a two minute drill on a, on a certain technique and I made the speech at the end of it. I said, okay, the next time you do that sequence, maybe in front of 4,000 people. You might drill it tomorrow, you might drill it next week, but there's so much to do in MMA you may not revisit that particular technique mm -hmm. for another few months. Mm -hmm. And within that time, you may have a contest. Mm -hmm. During that contest, you may say to yourself, I want to do that technique. So the next time you do that, you went from doing it two minutes, uh, a couple of repetitions of it on the mat, and the next time might be in front of thousands and thousands of people. So did you make the best use of that two minutes? 
Were you for that two minutes, did, maybe you did it five times in the two minutes. Was each of those five times, were you in the contest? Did you see the crowd? Was that the, the toughest opponent of your life? Could you hear your coach? Did you, did you picture what it'd be like hearing someone scream over here? And the guys I've noticed that, were, that, got, that got good fast, they, you'd look at them and you'd, you'd know they weren't in the gym. Mm-hmm. They were in T-Mobile Arena mm-hmm. with 18,000 screaming fans and 2 million people on, on pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. Whereas the other person mindlessly went through the five repetitions. Mm-hmm. They both did the same number of repetitions. They both did the same training session, but one's was a very different two minutes than the other. And that's on a micro level. And if we do that on every two minute drill, on every session daily for months, and years, all of a sudden we have a talented fighter. So I've yet to see somebody who is talented that didn't have that approach to their training. And I've been very, very lucky through my, through my uh, relationship with Connor that I've met some incredibly high level um, soccer players like Ronaldo, um, artists, actors, all of them. And I always have this conversation with them and they all say the same thing, that when they were practicing, it was with a different type of purpose than their teammates practicing or other people that were trying to do the same thing as them. Their practice, whether it was taught to them or whether they read about it or whether it was just the way they did everything, was with a level of focus and purpose that was leagues ahead of everybody. Um, I'm not a big soccer fan. I don't watch uh, football, soccer. But when I spoke to Ronaldo, it was it was... It was so funny to me. He was, it was basically like Connor with a different face. And he has achieved everything in, in, in football. He's won everything, player of the year and all these different championships. And he still talks about certain sequences and certain games. And you see it in his face, this intensity that you just know is what's made him talented. So I think the idea of talent is bullshit. Perfect. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you, sir.